I think I can truly put up all the change that has come into my politics into a sentence. I was brought up to distrust and dislike liberty. I learned to believe in it. That is the key to all my changes. The 19th century was the heyday of classical liberalism, and it was no coincidence that the world's superpower at the time, Great Britain, was full of liberal ideologues. All the scribblings of the greats such as Acton, Cobden, Spencer, and others would have stayed in the realm of ideas rather than the realm of man without the efforts of political men such as the subject of this video, William Ewart Gladstone. Springtime of Nations has never and will never worship statesmen, and Mr. Gladstone certainly has his faults that will be examined here, but no man did more for the cause of liberty in his own lifetime and no man's death was more of a blow to the battle of liberty than the grand old man himself. Gladstone was not born a liberal, nor, as he said in the opening quote, was he raised in liberalism. Coming from a well-to-do Scottish family, he was sent off to Eton boarding school and then to Christchurch College, from which he graduated in 1832. Gladstone's family were devout Protestants, and he, by all accounts, was pious even while one of the most popular boys at school, becoming president of the Oxford Debate Union. At school and later when he graduated, he held to his familial political associations, being very much a high Tory. The Tory party, arrayed against the Whigs in Parliament, stood firmly in favor of statism, religious bigotry, and a host of economic protections on old money taken by force centuries ago. The year he graduated, his father arranged for him to run in his first parliamentary election, which he won. While a confident and rhetorically deadly friend to privilege, he eventually found himself allied with Sir Robert Peel, and like Peel, drifted more and more from ancient Toryism to supporting measures that even the Whigs were too afraid of. One of these measures was free trade, specifically free trade in corn, or grains of all types. The tariff on corn was a bedrock of the Tory party, because it was one of the ways the British government subsidized the great estates of the aristocracy, who were, after all, the primary supporters of the Tories. While the Anti-Corn Law League of Richard Cobden and John Bright had been advocating for a removal of the tariff, which cut deep into the purses of the working class, it was the potato famine in Ireland that brought it to a head. Peel, the Prime Minister, shocked his party by agreeing with this plan and was able to force it through the House of Commons with the help of the Whigs. This action, which probably saved many lives in Ireland, tore the Tory party apart. Gladstone went with Peel and his Peelites, who sat alone for a time, giving power to a successive Whig government and then to a coalition between the two blocks in 1852 in which Gladstone became the Chancellor of the Exchequer the British equivalent of the finance minister. In addition to his evolution on free trade, Gladstone's respectable religious bigotry of youth had become not only a belief in a Catholic emancipation, but his own religious views became closer and closer to the Oxford movement of the 1830s, which sought to add old Catholic rituals and structures to the Church of England. Gladstone formed close relationships with liberal Catholic professor Dolinger and his English disciple, John Dalberg Acton, who was to become Gladstone's conscience on matters such as religious liberty and the Irish question. By 1859, Gladstone had shorn all connection to the Conservative Party and now affiliated with the new Liberal Party formed by Whigs, Radicals, and the Peelite bloc. Peel himself had died in 1850. He became Chancellor of Exchequer again under the first Liberal government, under Lord Palmerston. The following parliamentary session was to be world-changing, thanks to Gladstone's efforts. Richard Cobden, laissez-faire giant, who we've covered in a previous video, had been negotiating with fellow liberal Michel Chevalier about lifting duties on the great exports of their native countries, manufactured goods, coal and iron from the UK, and the world-famous French wine, brandy, and silk. This free trade agreement was the largest proposed of its kind, and polite society in Britain was terrified of its effects. Fighting illness, Gladstone made a pair of historic speeches in favor and was widely credited in having it go through. Imports between the two states doubled, and the Cobden-Chevalier Treaty is seen as a turning point in Anglo-French relations 
from old enemies to friendly competitors. There was once a time when close relations of amity were established between the governments of England and France. It was in the reign of the later Stuarts, and it marks a dark spot in our annals, because it was a union formed in a spirit of domineering ambition on the one side and of base and vile subserviency on the other. But that, sir, was not a union of the nations, it was a union of the governments. This is not to be a union of the governments, it is to be a union of the nations. The following year held another consequential event in foreign policy. The United States Union had been dissolved. On one side, slavers touting free trade and states' rights. On the other, a centralizing Puritan rump state. It wasn't hard to see why the majority of the Liberal Party had at least some sympathy for the Southern, even while they had condemned and indeed abolished slavery in the British Empire, albeit peacefully. Gladstone himself had on his political journey gone from defending the institution to, as president of the Board of Trade, sought to help its demise by removing sugar tariffs from all non-slave produced sugar, all major producers excepting Spanish Cuba and Brazil, in 1844. With all this in mind, Gladstone went on to say regarding the American crisis, We may have our own opinions about slavery. We may be for or against the South. But there is no doubt that Jefferson Davis and other leaders of the South have made an army. They are making, it appears, a navy. And they have made what is more than either. They have made a nation. We may anticipate with certainty the success of the southern states so far as regards their separation from the North. I cannot but believe that that event is as certain as any event yet future and contingent can be. Despite this stance, Gladstone would show his love of peace and justice during his resolution of the Alabama claims, wherein the British had let the Confederacy build raiding ships such as the CSS Alabama in British ports. There was intense pressure after the war in the UK to rebuff the Americans from seeking reparations from this, as the U.S. had recently been seen as turning a blind eye to Irish paramilitary raids into Canada from across the American border, and relations between the two powers were the worst they'd been in decades. With the retirement of the Prime Minister Palmerston in 1867, Gladstone assumed the leadership of the Liberal Party and led it to a smashing electoral victory the next year, defeating the man who had become his greatest rival, the Tory Benjamin Disraeli. The new Gladstone administration signed the Treaty of Washington in 1871, acceding to international arbitration of the Alabama claims and awarding millions of dollars to the United States, restoring Anglo-American amity to its pre-war levels. Gladstone and Disraeli had by now become the avatars of their respective parties, and the two would trade places between opposition leader and prime minister until Disraeli's demise in 1881. With his passing, Gladstone had free reign to conduct policy, but this sadly led to his downfall. Gladstone's intervention and occupation of Egypt in 1882 was seen as a betrayal to the principles of peace, retrenchment, and reform, with laissez-faire liberal John Bright leaving the government over it. Indeed, a younger Gladstone speaking on the 1853 Crimean War that Bright also opposed said this, When we speak of general war, we don't mean real progress on the road of freedom, the real moral and social advancement of man achieved by force. This may be the intention, but how rarely is it the result of general war? We mean this, that the face of nature is stained with human gore. We mean that taxation is increased and industry diminished. We know that it means that burdens unreasonable and untold are entailed on late posterity. We know that it means the demoralization is let loose, that families are broken up, that lusts become unbridled in every country to which that war is extended. By 1885, Gladstone had lost the confidence of the House and resigned by a combination of the Tories and the Home Rule Party, who sought Irish autonomism. Ireland had long been a simmering problem for Britain and Gladstone, from the famine which surrounded the death knell of the Corn Laws 
to the 1867 Fanian guerrilla uprisings, after which Gladstone's administration had shown clemency to these men and deported them from the British Isles. And now liberal government depended on taking a strong stand on the Irish question. In 1845, William wrote his wife, Ireland, Ireland, that cloud in the West, that coming storm, that minister of God's retribution upon cruel, inveterate, and but half-atoned injustice. Ireland forces upon us those great social and great religious questions. God grant that we may have courage to look them in the face and to work through them. The Home Rule Party kept the Liberals out of office again in 1886 until Gladstone relented and proposed a Home Rule Bill, collapsing the Tory minority government and beginning one of the most acrimonious chapters in British political history. Liberals split over this issue, creating the Liberal Unionist Party, which eventually joined with the Tories officially in 1895. Bolstered by his friend and confidant, Lord Acton, in the righteousness of the cause, Gladstone continued to champion the Home Rule Bill, getting it passed after the 1892 election but defeated in the House of Lords, always the more reactionary house. In 1894, at the age of 84, the oldest ever Prime Minister in British history, Gladstone finally tendered his resignation to the Queen for the fourth and last time. After his retirement, the Liberal Party, though never totally abandoning the cause of Irish home rule, fell away from Gladstone's principles in many other ways, towards statism, towards imperialism, and towards that society Herbert Spencer called military rather than the industrial one that made England prosperous and free. Gladstone's son Herbert, chief whip of the Liberals, made an alliance with the Labour Party in 1903, and the progressives in the party itself, led by men such as Herbert Asquith, transitioned liberalism from orthodox Gladstonianism to one that embraced centralizing interventionist reforms, the new Toryism warned about by Herbert Spencer. Spencer's prediction that the socialists and the militarists would join in an alliance was proven tragically correct, as Asquith's government entered into World War I, ostensibly to protect Belgian neutrality. The wise Council of Gladstone, who kept the United Kingdom out of the Franco-German War in 1870, was nowhere to be seen, and Britain was not just shorn of hundreds of thousands of her young men and tons of her treasure built up by peaceful commerce, but her liberty was curtailed in a way that would make Oliver Cromwell blush. Britain's terrible, Pyrrhic victory was followed by Ireland, with no other recourse offered them but submission to eternal subjugation, rising up and tearing the British Isles asunder. Britain was only able to keep the northernmost six counties while the Irish nationalists took the lion's share. In 1930, George V privately confessed to his Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald, what fools we were to not have accepted Gladstone's Home Rule Bill. The empire now would not have had the Irish Free State giving us so much trouble and pulling us to pieces. Gladstone, his legacy defaced by his own party, began fading into obscurity. In 1944, Hayek wrote, Perhaps nothing shows this change more clearly than that. While there is no lack of sympathetic treatment of Bismarck in contemporary English literature, the name Gladstone is rarely mentioned by the younger generation without a sneer over his Victorian morality and naive utopianism. The rise and fall of the ideas of freedom, just as salient in the United States and eerily following much the same steps, from initial victory to a lax contentment, and finally, to the wave of progressivism, a liberal-coded scientific statism, must be studied. Soon this channel will release a reflection on the change in our political fortunes between the 19th and 21st centuries. Why did liberalism fail? The blame cannot be put on one man or one movement. Byron, Cobden, Acton, Gladstone, Spencer, Garibaldi, Bolivar, all these liberal men had something to teach us, both by their success and failure. With their lessons from the past, we can help make a free, liberal future. God rest William Gladstone, and may a thousand flowers bloom.